the to a novel treatment option Shivam Mittal from uh, Abu Dhabi will uh, present uh, what is really useful in our clinical practice. What's really hot in the novel treatment for essential tremor? My talk will be divided into these sections. First will be the pharmacological treatment and the neuromodulation techniques, MRI guided focus ultrasound, the novel techniques for bottom toxin injections and some assistive devices and techniques. Uh, this is a nice summary uh, of what we'll be talking about today. If you look at the uh, pharmacotherapy, we're talking about four uh, ways that we can modulate uh, essential tremor symptoms. Uh, then we're talking about the bottom toxin, deep brain stimulation, MRI guided focus ultrasound. And I have not included the assistive devices, but that will be also discussed. What do we know at this point for essential tremor? We've been treating with essential tremor patients with the same medications for so many years. And we know all these medications by heart now that in the propranolol, primidone, topiramate, uh, they have good evidence, but they have limitations as well. Uh, ethanol, we know it really suppresses the tremor, but it, we do not prescribe it because of risk of uh, intoxication and addiction. Benzodiazepines can be helpful, but it has a lot of side effects. So there are a lot of other medications as well, but we have really low evidence that uh, it can be effective in treating essential tremor symptoms. So in the last three decades, there's no new approved treatment, but I'm very happy to say that uh, the lot of treatment in the pipeline, uh, which uh, I was able to review, and will try my level best to present in front of you. So this is a summary of the uh, four classes of uh, uh, mechanism of action that uh, presently uh, treatment is undergoing, looking at the T-type calcium channel blocking medications, GABA-A receptor positive allosteric modulators, small conductance calcium activated potassium or SK channels and possible role of cannabinous CB1 agonist receptors. So now these three are really uh, hot and happening. Uh, rest are uh, still in the pipeline. So let's talk with, start with the first one. I, uh, I like the uh, last slide of uh, Dr. Ko that we had this helping in the Perkins cell uh, pathophysiology, and I would not spend time into it, but I'll just jump to the medication that is called JZP385, previously called as CX8998, which is now also called as, uh, I would say, to memorize uh, as caltimide, so suvec caltimide. So all the caltimide group is a TTCC, which is the T-type calcium channel blocking medications. So there was a phase two clinical trial where T-CALM study was done with, um, in 95 patients. And uh, this uh, drug was given uh, two times a day and 28 days. And uh, uh, there was a significant improvement in the uh, scoring of tetras in the ADL activities, uh, but it was not um, significant when it was centrally rated tetras and the accelerometer. So there was improvement, but it was not clear why it was not showing up in the central tetras rating score. There were side effects, and after that, there was a phase 2B study, which is presently ongoing, and uh, it is recruiting patients. Uh, they are planning to recruit 400 patients um, uh, with multiple centers and finding the right dose as well of 10, 20, 30 milligrams of suvacaltimide. So we have to keep our eyes and ears open for the results of this study. Hopefully it's positive. The second medication, the second drug is Ulixa Keltamide, which is also a TTCC, uh, also called as Prax 944. This is also a selective TTCC blocker. And in the phase two studies, the results were uh, uh, um, good, uh, was suggesting that the tremor is better. So there was a phase two B study uh, called Essential One study, which is a randomized eight weeks double blind placebo controlled paddle group dose finding study. In this study, they recruited 132 patients and uh, with moderate to severe essential tremor. And um, the primary endpoint was actually modified Tetras ADL. It was not the regular Tetras ADL. They have moved the one question of Tetras ADL, which was a social impact to handwriting and uh, um, spirals. So they, uh, they said for two doses, 60 milligrams and 100 milligrams, and uh, looking at the results, 
So the modified Tetras ADL did not show clinical significance. Uh, it was not it was not statistically significant. But when they look at the uh, regular Tetras ADL, it was significant. Now, when we look at the breakdown of the patients, uh, the patients did very well with the drug for the ADLs, except for spirals and handwriting, and that brought that brought the score down. So they did a subgroup analysis and looking at the patients with ET who had intention tremor and they removed the patients who had intention tremor. So if you look at the uh, diagram on the right below screen, you will see that patients with ET without intention tremor, uh, this did very well with the drug. So, and it was statistically significant. So further studies is uh, ongoing. There was a recently published by the company, this open label extension, which showed that there was sustained improvement uh, in open label out outside the randomized double blind placebo control study. And uh, patients who had, were on placebo when they were moved to the drug, there was improvement in the tremor, which was noted as well. The other group of medication is the GABA A receptor positive allosteric modulator. Initially, the pathophysiology was, hope this will probably work as, uh, like we know, ethyl alcohol works, but there are some other pathophysiology which are yet to be explored. And uh, uh, Sage Therapeutics and Biogen, they've combined together to make this drug uh, BIIB124, Sage 324, uh, where, where there was an open label study where they gave one dose of this medicine and of this drug, and they found that the tremor improved by more than 50%. And uh, uh, it was even um, um, uh, tolerated quite well. So this, after this phase one, there was phase two A study, which is the kinetic study. So this is another randomized uh, study where they looked at the dose of 60 milligram of SAGE 324 and compared to placebo and looked at day 29. Uh, interestingly, you can see the graph that uh, patients who got the drug there was significant improvement in the tremor scores. And as the drug was withdrawn on day 29, the graph again uh, start going up. That means the tremor was returning back. And uh, when they did a subgroup analysis in patients who had severe tremor with tetras of more than 12, the results were more significant. So that's reassuring that patients who have moderate to severe tremor, they're responding more to this medication compared to who have mild and moderate tremor. But this was a positive study. The downside was significant side effects. These patients, you can see the list, 68% had somnolence, uh, dizziness, balance disorder, a lot of side effects. So maybe the dose was not right. So now there's a phase 2B study, which is a kinetic 2 study, where they are looking at the right dose. They're looking at the dose finding study with 15 milligrams, 30 milligrams, 60 milligram, and see uh, what it shows. So this is, they're presently recruiting uh, for this study. There's a, there was an abstract last year, but there's no update yet. Last time I checked was this morning. This is the, another pathophys mechanism of action. Uh, is called the uh, RIM2 Zelcap, which is a SK channel, which we talked about as a positive allosteric modulation of small conductance calcium activated potassium channels. Uh, there is no published data, but what I found from a uh, um, um, from a uh, video discussing with the company, discussing with the uh, with the um, society. I could get the data that it was probably safe and uh, the results were reassuring, but we need more, we are still waiting for more data from the study. Now this was, a, uh, this is a poster being presented uh, in this meeting uh, with an abstract number 965. And this is an important, uh, this was a third drug from the TTTC uh, class of medication, NBI 827104 which was a phase two study, and this study did not show any improvement uh, in any of, did, did not meet the primary or secondary endpoints. So um, uh, this is a useful abstract, so you should stop by um, when it is presented. The last is the CB1, the cannabis can, cannabinoid modulates CB1 receptors, and uh, there was some theory that maybe it alleviates a tremor. And uh, this is a single study where uh, the 19 patients had one dose of 300 milligrams of CBD. And uh, after the, the patients were studied at baseline and after 180 minutes, and there was no improvement in the tremor. So 
probably we need uh, more studies on this. We need uh, more chronic tr uh, treatment with CBD. I, maybe the one dose is not sufficient, but uh, uh, we need to do more research uh, on, on this uh, line of treatment. So coming out of the pharmacotherapy, let's move to deep brain stimulation. So there are a lot of advances in deep brain stimulation, as you've been hearing in other lectures uh, in the conference. Uh, there is advancement in imaging, sensing, directionality, adaptive, and programming, and many more. So I don't think I can finish this in the uh, next 20 minutes that I have, but I will just quickly go through a few of the basic concepts uh, so that we understand better. Now, talking about the targets, we know that VIM nucleus, the ventral intermediate nucleus, is, has been the target of choice for essential tremor. And uh, the new targets are being explored. Posterior subthalamic uh, area, PSA, has been, uh, has, is, is, uh, been looked at with keen interest, given a uh, lot of small studies showing good results, uh, sometimes better than VIM as well. Uh, this is a study where uh, it's a double blind crossover study where one lead was placed uh, just in that area that the top contact, the, the dorsal contact goes into the VIM and the lower bottom contact, the, the, the most ventral contact goes to the uh, PSA area. And uh, they cross over, they, uh, the patients initially uh, had uh, with one setting with the DPS and they come after the second setting with a wash or period. And what they found that uh, uh, PSA was equivalent or maybe better with regards to the improvement in the tremor. Again, this is a very small study, only in 13 patients, but at least we have some data now suggesting that there are more targets than VIM. Looking at the connectomes, uh, now we are moving away from the targets and we're looking more at the tracts. At the, uh, uh, as we know that this is more of a uh, issue with the tract, with the cerebellothalamic cortical tract. Um, uh, now we, uh, the sign, uh, we are looking into uh, uh, DRTT, the dentorubrothalamic tract, efferent cerebral fibers. This is a very nice study where uh, they have looked at the volume of tissue activation where the patients with essential tremor who had very good results after VIM uh, DBS, they looked at the, they did a DTI tractography and they found that the sweet spots where patients had good improvement was actually in the area where the DRTT track uh, uh, was located. So uh, uh, if you look at the, the coherence, it was going very well with the DRTT. So that might be a good option to consider uh, not aiming for VIM, of course, but aiming for VIM, but looking as a tract as well to further make it more patient specific when we are doing deep brain stimulation surgery. Brain sensing, so uh, this is uh, really helpful. Uh, now we are doing a lot of brain sensing for our Parkinson's disease patients. Now brain sensing, we are able to record the brain activity, the local field potentials. And um, I'll show this example. This is a very nice study by Newman, uh, where we have a neural signatures, the biomarkers for uh, different areas. Essential tremor so far, uh, it's linked to theta to alpha range of four to 13 hertz. Now, I'll give an example of what we are doing by the local field potential. When we're doing a deep brain stimulation, we're doing a micro recording. We're listening to the each neuron. Local field potential is listening to the whole entire stadium. So we are getting more uh, uh, concrete data. We are getting a broader target and uh, network electrical activity. So uh, we have more information that can be helpful uh, in better targeting. This is the uh, uh, screen that we see when we are programming the patients with uh, uh, deep brain stimulation, the percept device with sensing. And uh, patients can map uh, that this time they had the tremor, this time they don't have the tremor, or the tremor is more. This is more helpful in patients with Parkinson's disease with the motor fluctuations. But again, it's essential tremor can be affected even more sometimes in particular time of the day. And this can be helpful to record as well. This is a typical example that we use, uh, we see in Parkinson's disease that uh, you see the peak of the beta rhythm, uh, which we see in the off state exam. And when the patient is asymptomatic, the beta peak goes away. Now this is from uh, Dr. Bronte Stewart lab and uh, from Stanford. And we can see that the patient in the off state when he is asked to move his hand, uh, looking for bradykinesia, uh, we can see a very prominent uh, 25 Hertz uh, 
uh, local field potential, the beta rhythm, which completely goes away when the DBS is switched on with a clinical improvement. And when we are stimulating the patients, we can actually live, we can look at the beta frequency and we can see when we are stimulating the deep, the in voltage, we can see the dip down in the, uh, local, in the local field potential, in the beta power. Coming to the thalamic local field potential, uh, this is a recent study where uh, they, the authors have done accelerometry looking at the hand tremor and also looking at the, uh, at the uh, uh, local field potential and they found a 3.8 hertz frequency peak trem which was recorded during the activation by accelerometry and uh, activity the same and superharmonic frequency was seen in the frequency spectrum of the local field potential and there was good coherence to it. Now, what else uh, we are doing in deep brain simulation? We are all aware of the directional, uh, directionality of all the DB, deep brain stimulation devices. Now, all the companies are doing directional leads, but we also have this MICC, what we call that as a multiple independent con current control. So in case the lead is not properly placed or we want to reduce the amount of uh, stimulation or reduce uh, battery use, we can direct the uh, stimulation through one of the contacts and uh, use a constant current electrode and we can uh, modify the directionality of the stimulation. Now this is something which is uh, uh, really uh, uh, advancing and uh, the adaptive or the closed loop designs. We are really dependent on the patient coming to the clinic after every two or three months or every month and we are changing or making some setting changes based on what they report subjectively. Now, I think with the era of AI machine learning, we are going more into automotive phase where patient is wearing a, a watch with an accelerometer with a gyroscope, and uh, we are able to regulate how the tremor is controlled during the daytime. And this can give a feedback to the deep brain stimulation to the device with the recording of the local field potential. And uh, this is something that we are uh, making it more efficiently controlled system that's adaptive or closed loop design. So um, there are a few ways to do it. Uh, there is there is a sensors. There are uh, there's a CTM data. There is a uh, uh, there's sensors. Uh, the new technology which is advancing in this field, I think, which is very helpful, especially for a sensual tremor when they're trying to hold a cup of coffee and trying to pour water, uh, this gives a signal to the brain and this will help to increase more stimulation at that time. And then when they're relaxing or sitting with family, uh, the stimulation is less. This can help to avoid the side effects that we usually see with uh, chronic stimulation with the deep brain stimulation, such as uh, balance issues or speech issues. And this can help with the habituation as well. So. Uh, I, I am really looking forward to uh, more advancements in this field, and I think we are going in the right direction here. There's also a concept of putting uh, subdural paddle type uh, leads over the primary motor and sensory cortex so we can record the brain activity, and that can get in touch with the uh, device to give uh, uh, feedback, and that can be helpful uh, in a closed loop. This is a very recent study. And I was amazed by uh, the work uh, the, the group has done, where uh, the patient is wearing a, a sensor watch and uh, uh, everything is automatic. So it's automatic and closed loop, where a uh, patient uh, uh, watch, wears a watch and holds a hand in particular direction. So the recording is done. So we have a baseline. There's a, there's a graphical board where a patient writes the side effects that he, is, he or she is hap that is happening, maybe uh, dysarthria or gait difficulty, and patient is making a note. So that goes into the, uh, the, the IMU, which is the data which is collected to the model, and that goes to the uh, Python application that uh, optimizes and gives a setting and say, okay, now patient is having side effect, the tremor is still happening, we have to move to a different setting. So this automatically adjusts and uh, uh, gives uh, uh, much more refined uh, settings for individualistic patient. Now this is the, what we see at the end. Uh, the, the, the red spotted line is the, the limit that the clinician has given. So it is still monitored by a physician it's not completely AI, but uh, we have a limit, and red color goes with the uh, too much of uh, side effects and not much of tremor control, and blue is very good tremor control with uh, less side effects. 
So we can see which is a sweet spot and you can see that the green is the area where they're currently studying and the black spots are more in the blue area that shows that those are the areas where the patient had good improvement. So this is something that, uh, is, uh, uh, that we have been doing at uh, Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi. Uh, this is a variable, this is a patient with a tremor and uh, patient is wearing variables. We can uh, record the tremor. Many times the tremor is not visible, but it is still there. And uh, uh, with these very sensitive sensors, we can pick up uh, how much tremor is under good control. On. So I will ask him to hold his hand up. It gives me a frequency of the tremor live. So, so now the stimulation will happen, holding a cup. So we can see that uh, clinically it looks much better and even on the recording, the sensors, we can see that tremor is under very good control. So we can find it just based on what we see and we have more objective recording. Now coming to the MRI guided focus ultrasound treatment, this is a significant recent advancement in the field of essential tremor. Uh, in this technique, what we're doing is high intensity focus ultrasound is being delivered uh, to, to cause a thermal uh, tissue ablation. The tissue temperature and lesion size can be measured in real time in the MRI. And uh, the real time monitoring of side effects and the improvement. Initial study was done in 2013 with FDA approval in 2016 for unilateral uh, Thelmotomy. This was the initial study which led to the FDA approval by Elias et al. group. Uh, and, uh, and there was a follow up study in 2021 by a Japanese group, uh, Dr. Abe. And uh, you can see there's a significant improvement in the overall side effect profile or adverse effects. If you look at three months follow up with the initial study, there was 38% patient had paresthesias and 36% patient had gait disturbance. If you look at the uh, in 2021 study, the, the side effect profile is much lesser. And at, by one year, there were, nobody had any side effect. Mm -hmm. So it shows that with time, we are getting better and better with better technology and better understanding of the underlying phenomena. Now, this is a study published uh, where they are doing bilateral MRI guided focus ultrasound for essential tremor. It is uh, one of the first trial called best first phase two trial where only 10 patients had, uh, who already had a unilateral um, surge, uh, a thalamotomy using MRI guided focus ultrasound. Uh, after an average of nine months, they went for the other side uh, because of the sibling tremor. And uh, uh, the, the goal was to have the lesion smaller and more superior to avoid uh, the side effects. And in the study, we found that 70% patients had side effects and 33% uh, had persistent mild or moderate effects. But if you ask the patient that would you have gone for this surgery, they say, all said yes. So this is something that we also have to look at the patient feedback. So this is something that is being explored. Uh, there's an abstract in this meeting, 982, if you're interested, uh, and uh, one more study being recently published uh, as an abstract. Gamma knife telemotomy, only a slide on it. Uh, this was the role of gamma knife has reduced after the advancements in DBS and uh, MRI guided focus ultrasound. But this is a recent study published uh, by uh, Hori Sawa group. And um, in 27 patients, they found that there was 50 to 55 percent improvement. So just to make sure that everybody's on the same page, gamma knife is using cobalt, uh, extra cobalt radiation. And the effect we see is not immediate. The effect is usually delayed. So usual improvement happens after five to five months to six months later. So there can be delayed side effects and that can be delayed effect or no effect as well. So in this study, they found that patients had 50 to 55% improvement and six out of 27 had adverse events, including one death and hemiparesis. So um, uh, due to, due to en enlarging hematoma. So we have still room to go to understand better how we can minimize the risk in GABA knife. Now coming to the, uh, the almost the last topic, last section of this, which is a botulinum toxin and essential tremor. 
this is a topic very close to my heart. Uh, this is, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, this algorithm, so botulinum toxin, it relaxes the muscle. Uh, patients who have refractive tremor or we cannot do deep brain stimulation or cannot, are not, not ready to go for any ablative procedures, uh, botulinum toxin holds a good chance to control the tremors symptomatically, at least for three months' time. In this uh, diagram, you see that the first clinical trial was done in 1996 and 2001, and we did a first customized injection approach in 2018, the ones in the red. Now, the initial com concept was fixed dose, fixed muscles. So everybody gets the same muscle, same dose. But now we know everybody is different based on the tremor. You have to individualize the dose, customize the dose. And that's how we came up with the Yale technique where uh, we are giving injections in a customized way in uh, using EMG, lower dose, more muscles, and uh, improve the tremor without, with, and re reduce the side effects. This is from a study that was a double-blind placebo-controlled study uh, published in 2017. And uh, you can see the results that these are the muscles that were injected. Uh, there were multiple muscles. On an average, six to eight muscles were injected in one arm and dose of around 80 to 100 units of uh, inco botulinum toxin A. And uh, there was persistent improvement until three months' time, and the effects started going down. Now, this is a recent review article we wrote, uh, uh, and this is on the common muscles injected. So there's, this was, uh, since then, there are multiple few, few more studies being published. And uh, I'll just show a video of the injection technique. <coughs> So activate the muscle. I'm asking the patient to uh, uh, push on my hand, and I can uh, listen to the EMG activity of the tremor. Now, this is a patient who has a writing tremor. So when he is writing, he has a prominent action tremor. The medications were not helping. He had a bottom toxin injection in the forearm muscles, and he had very good improvement in his hand tremor symptoms. Now, there is an article, there's an abstract uh, by Dr. Victor Fung Group from Australia, where is a randomized double and placebo control study on inco bottom toxin A uh, as an abstract number 985. So you should stop by and have a look. The results are very similar to our study that in 2017 with. Uh, only one patient reported moderate to severe arm weakness and uh, statistical significant improvement in tremor scores and quality of life, Quest score. There's a multi-centric clinical trial going on by AbbVie M21471, where they're recruiting 174 patients with the individualized uh, EMG-guided bottom toxin injections uh, for essential tremor patients. So they are still recruiting, and uh, we look forward to the results of the study. Coming to the very last part, which is the variables and assistive devices. This is a brilliant review article uh, by Laura Million, and uh, where they have, they have described all the studies and uh, variables that patients can use to reduce the essential tremor symptoms. There's active orthosis, efferent neuroprosthesis, FES neuroprosthesis, and soft robotic exoskeletons. I think this is a talk of its own uh, to discuss all these things. but. There are a lot of things happening in the device therapy. Uh, this one is a Kala device, which is a transcutaneous efferent pattern stimulation. You are stimulating the median nerve and the radial nerve using a, a device where it is causing the peripheral modulation, which indirectly affects the sensory uh, stimulation up to the uh, central modulation. So if you look at the, the pie charts, the results are really remarkable. But if you look at the overall distribution of patients, most of the patients are mild to moderate. If you look at uh, this pie chart on the left side, mild is 50% patients had mild tremor. And there were 62% patients who moved from uh, moderate, to moderate and severe to mild and slight on the tetra scale. So a good, a good improvement for mild to moderate hand tremor symptoms. This is a real-time study they did on the patients, and they found that more than 59% patient, 59% patient had more than 50% reduction in the hand tremor. Uh, this was again uh, done by the uh, color trio. 
So to summarize, if you remember this slide, I think that brings up all the highlights of the talk. Uh, we discussed about the pharmacotherapy, MRI guided focus ultrasound, deep brain stimulation, bottom toxin, and test on the assistive devices. This is uh, beautiful Abu Dhabi, UAE. Uh, you're most welcome to come here and uh, have a look at the city. It's beautiful in the winter months, not in the summer months. And this is our team. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ivan, for this great talk that now is open for discussion.